Welcome to a virtual version of the Lord's Day service for September 11th, 2022. I'll start by reading some scripture. Our first reading today is from 1 Timothy. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. I am grateful to Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has strengthened me because he judged me faithful and appointed me to his service. And even though I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and a man of violence, but I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord overflowed for me and the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. The saying is sure and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came to the, into the world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost. But for that very reason, I received mercy so that in me as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display the utmost patience making me an example to those who come to believe in him for eternal life. To the king of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Our gospel reading today is from Luke. Hear what the Spirit saying to the church. Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to him, listening. And the Pharisees and scribes were grumbling and saying, this fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. Which one of you, having a hundred sheep and losing one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one who is lost to find it? When he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders and rejoices. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so, I tell you, there, is, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over the ninety-nine righteous people who needed no repentance." Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one of them, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? When she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I have lost. Just so, I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents." These are the words of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I have sometimes said that alcoholics and addicts know God better than most of us do, really almost than anyone. And I'm not sure that that's always been taken as I've meant it to be received. But all of us are affected by addiction, whether we admit it or not. Even if you haven't had a serious addiction in your life, yourself, you know people who struggle, maybe in your family or your friends. It's a major part of being a human. And even though it is not in the language that we understand in the Bible, it does permeate the biblical narrative as well. There's lots of scientific literature, literature about morality and addiction. Traditionally, there's been a strong belief that addiction is a result of moral weakness. Of course, that's been the traditional view. But anyone who has been close to people with addiction know that that can't be so. It, that's not all there is. So in recent decades, there has been a movement to call an addiction disease. This has yielded a new sense of compassion for people who have addictions, with, and that has been very welcome. It's something that has been needed. You know, just think about the positive role about, that Betty Ford had, for example, and the role of rehabilitation clinics and how value they, valuable they have been to destigmatize addiction in our society. But one problem with the purely disease orientation is that it removes the role of free will. More recently, there has been a lot of research about balanced approaches between moralization and disease operating together. 
There is this sense that there is choice and free will. We do make choices in our lives. Some of them are moral choices, but at the same time, these choices can and are often are limited by an underlying disease. Now, these may be hereditary factors for addiction, but also just even the physical and mental impairment that it, that it entails. Huh, that kind of sounds familiar to us, doesn't it? Because we as Christians often think about the mixture of free will and factors that are beyond our control. This is where science and medicine intersect. And they intersect with the spiritual. This is why medical treatment and counseling are often augmented with AA or other, some other faith-based or spiritually based groups in, addic in addiction recovery. Because as most physicians know, most health workers know that you must treat the whole person to have a good outcome, physically, mentally, and also spiritually. So it's worth reframing what we read in the Bible into a language that we can use. Rather than just revering the Bible, I believe that we need to make it useful for real people. Now, I guess that kind of makes me a utilitarian. <laughs> and it means that, uh, you know, I find that there are parts of the Bible that are very helpful and we can use those. There are parts that, however, that are not helpful. Now, while I think it's important that we understand these parts of the Bible of Scripture, it doesn't mean we have to use them. We can use what we need to. Because one of the most negative things that people do to use the Bible is they use it to shame people. Piling up shame, especially on people with addictions, is exactly the wrong thing you to do because all you're doing is piling up on something that's already there. You're making it harder because shame is rocket fuel for alcoholism and addictions of all kinds. It's something that we have to deal with. So I think that it's important that we look at things a little differently. Now, our verses today are all about redemption, all about starting over, beginning a new phase in life. Starting over is at the heart of the redemption story that's at the basis of our uh, Christian experience. It's about stumbling and falling off and then having the grace to get up and start over again. It's one of the hardest things to do in life. And no matter who you are, it's a skill that everybody needs to know in order to succeed in life. Paul is a huge example of somebody who turned his life around. In 1 Timothy 1, he calls himself a former blasphemer, a persecutor, a man of violence. And as we know from Acts 8, he was especially cruel. He thought nothing about tearing families apart, beating people, and executing them all in the name of the Lord, at least so he thought. He was the worst of the worst. But he also hints that he didn't know any better. He was deluded. So yes, he made bad decisions, but he also just sounds like a man that was out of control. Maybe a man who was addicted. Unable to see humanity in others so wrapped up in his own world. But he was won over by the unending grace of Christ Jesus. He had an epiphany. It was a giant wake-up call that he had. And like some of the friends that I know whose lives have turned around in just one day, he could pinpoint the time and date of his redemption. And sometimes it works that way, doesn't it? He truly had his road to Damascus moment, of course, in a flash of blinding light. 
Have you ever experienced that in your life too? I know I have. In Luke, there are more gentle images that are truly beautiful. Jesus is being criticized for hanging out with tax collectors and sinners. These are basically the people who have lots of problems. These are the hustlers because that's the only way they can get their next meal. These are the cheaters because they've grown up cynical and they just don't know any other way of life. These are the people on the street, you know, the wasted, the strung out, the drunks, because they're entrapped in their addictions. They're entrapped by loneliness and by shame. These are the people the Pharisees and respectable people in society have given up on. They've just turned the other way. We don't have to imagine very hard when we spend time with real people, even in, an, in our own society. We see them all the time, and we can interact with them and see them if we choose to. But then Jesus tells us two uh, marvelous parables. One is about the lost sheep. One out of a hundred. Only one percent. That one wretched sheep. And then we hear about the joy of his return. Now, you know, it kind of didn't really make economic sense for the shepherd to risk the other 99 sheep just to find the one. But he did it anyway. And he did it as an act of love. No one's left behind. And isn't it funny that we sometimes imagine a God who's all too willing to leave people behind, you know, like in the end times, leave people to go away. But here we see that no one is forgotten, not even one out of a hundred sheep. Then Jesus talks about the woman who, has, who lost a coin. It's the same story, but with bigger consequences. You see, this woman was probably a widow because the widows would wear a headdress and they would have coins sewn into the headdress because this is her dowry and this is all that she had left. To lose even one of ten coins would have been devastating for her. And Jesus turns from this less consequential, the one sheep out of a hundred, bound by love, to the absolutely essential, the one out of ten for the, for the woman. The stakes have been raised. They've been lit, raised literally tenfold. It's one thing to lose a sheep, and it's another thing for a woman to face starvation. In both cases, who would not rejoice about the 100 or the 10 for those who repent and are found again. In fact, these two parables come just before the prodigal son story. We, and we didn't read that today, but you know the story about the one son that goes away, literally one of two. And the rejoicing about his repentance, about his return. Think about all the th terrible things that that young man did and the worry of his father, and the joy of his turning around and coming home. Well, this is something I really want to highlight for a second, because I think it really can be very helpful to us to understand what this means. One word I want to highlight that's very pivotal here, both in Paul's conversion, in the redemption we have from our addictions, and in these parables, is the word metanoia. In English, this is usually translated as repentance. And frankly, however, repentance is a loaded word because we always think of repentance in moral terms. And it kind of limits our view of it. And as it is said about re redemption or about addiction, it's not just the moral aspect, but it's also the disease aspect. It's the things you can control and the things that you can't control. Because metanoia actually means turning around. Meta is a preposition. It, means, it can mean with 
or accompanying, but it also means afterwards or behind. And in, it's really the sense about leaving something behind, leaving the old way behind and turning around and coming back. That's a little bit more, that's what repentance means, but in a bigger way, in, in all kinds of ways. Throughout literature, it is a major turning point. There, it's, so it's way more than just cognitive regret. Oh, I'm so sorry I did that. It's really more about a pivot point in life. It's like cold turkey. It's like taking that last drink that you took years ago and you know the exact date when you became sober. It's like that time you gave up on that toxic relationship and you walked away and you said, I'm done. You probably know the exact date of that, too. It's like that day maybe when you walked out of prison, determined never to come back again. That's what this metanoia is about. I know that feeling myself. It was when I said yes to being a Christian as a teenager at a John Fisher concert. It was that time I knew that I would lose the loveliest girl I ever met in my life if I didn't turn my life around. It was that time when I knew I needed to face that my dad was an alcoholic and I needed to do whatever I could to help him. It was that time five years ago when I quit my job and I went into seminary and then I went into the ministry. I knew that that was a turning point, and I can remember those exact days when they happened, because these are all metanoia moments, big turning points in my life. I know that they're true for you, too. In fact, some of you have told me about your big turning points in your lives. So instead of thinking about everything about being just repentance in a moral sense, it's valuable for you to think about metanoia moments, the big turning points in your life, because they really kind of are the same thing, because this is what redemption looks like. It's bigger. I stand by my claim that alcoholics and addicts know God better, because they know better than most people what they can choose and what they can control in their lives, and what they can't. Too often we see these things in black and white. Too often we say, like the psalmist says in our readings today, there's no one that does good. Well, that's hyperbole. In isolation, and it's, isolation is just not true. You have to look at the whole thing. Because we're a mixture of light and dark. We're a mixture of morals and disease. There are things we can choose and control, and there are many things that we can't choose and we can't control. All addicts know this. They all know that they can't do it alone. But the gospel story makes it so that we don't, it really doesn't matter it's not about moral purity. It's not about making yourself acceptable to God. No, it's about simply turning around, picking yourself up, making a change. Some changes are dramatic and lifelong where you can remember that time, you can remember that date forever. Other changes are just long slogs of backsliding, giving up, picking yourself up, but then recognizing that you can't do it alone. It's of being a tax collector, being a cheat, being an addict, being one of the hundred who repents, one of the 10 coins that is found, being the one son that went away and turned around and came back. The one thing I want to ask of you, my friends, is to give yourself as much grace as the Lord Jesus gives you. 
that you give your fellow human being as much grace as Jesus gives them. That you put your shame aside and graciously receive the redemption of Jesus wherever you are on your journey. Let us pray. Holy and gracious God, we are your people. We are created wonderfully, wonderfully complicated, and wonderfully blessed. You gave us free will, and you gave us urges that we cannot control. As we navigate through life, you equip us and support us no matter where we are. We thank you for that, that all the ways in which we depend on you and each other. And we express your grace to the world around us. In Christ's holy name I pray. Amen.